Okay, well, let's start. Uh, good morning, good evening, and welcome to this first day of Programmers Week 2020 edition. My name is Felipe Ortiz, and I'll be giving you a broad overview of the top 10 web security vulnerabilities found on the report made by the OWASP Foundation for its 2017 edition. I would like to open this talk with a quote from Stefan Napo, uh, that is the CISO of the year 2018 and vice president of the group SCB that really struck me. And I think is very appropriate for this subject. And it goes in like this, it takes 20 years to build a reputation and a few minutes of a cyber incident to ruin it. Okay, so first things first, uh, let's take a look at the OWASP Foundation. The Open Web Application Security Project is an international nonprofit organization dedicated to web application security. And the OWASP Top 10 is a regularly updated report and that outlines uh, security concerns for web application security, uh, making focus on the 10 most critical risks and OWASP and refers to this top 10 as an awareness document. And they recommend um, that we um, incorporate this report into our processes in order to minimize and mitigate any security risk. Uh, okay, so let's begin with the number one web application security risk that will be injection. In terms of exploitability and detectability, um, it's a very serious uh, concern because it can be catastrophic to the business. And we can not longer rely on the data that we have stored. Possibly that data might be corrupted or can evolve into a denial of service. And worst case scenario, um, it can take down uh, our database uh, management system or input some commands into our operating system. Uh, the most common and well known of this type of vulnerability is SQL injection, but others may include um, LDAP, XPath, or even no SQL injection. So, in the technical aspect, we can conclude that this is a very dangerous issue and can compromise all of our systems. Now, um, let's take a look at what is considered injection. And that is when an untrusted query that has taken from any user input um, and it's applied to any query or interpreter and we assume that the input uh, that the user has made, uh, it's going to take the form that we expect uh, in our system. But the attacker leverages on this aspect and malform this input. So it has unintended consequences in, in our system. Uh, in terms of how common this vulnerability uh, is out there, it's not the most common but certainly is the most serious um, found in web applications. And if a website is vulnerable, it's pretty easy to take advantage of it. And it also, um, it's pretty simple to find out if a website is vulnerable. Um, this type of vulnerability is usually found in legacy PHP and ASP applications, uh, but in this, this, does not, uh, this doesn't imply that it is in common in Java Enterprise Edition applications and ASP.NET applications. The latter doesn't generally allow SQL injections, but we cannot assume that uh, apps written in those frameworks are prone to this vulnerability. So in order to prevent this type of uh, vulnerability on existing websites, we need to ditch the interpreter we use in our queries to the database. Uh, we could make use of parameterized queries to escape and sanitize the user inputs, or even we can, we can make use of um, 
store procedures so we can be more restrictive on the data that we present back to the user. Also, if we can um, restrict uh, what the user assigned in the database for the application can do inside it, um, and we can revoke any delete, insert, update, or select permissions, that will be much better. And coming in second place, we have broken authentication. Uh, this type of vulnerability is still ranking in second place in 2013 edition. And regarding its exploitability and technical impact is severe because not only the risk that this not only risks the user confusion data, but the entire organization systems may be compromised as an attacker um, may be able to impersonate other users and it can jeopardize our network. And well, the prevalence and detectability of this vulnerability is mild amongst applications. It can be detected via a range of tools like the ones of Hydra or Burp Suite, or even more specialized tool sets like Kali Linux. So uh, for the attacker to exploit this, um, it must be able to impersonate an actual user in our application. And if our implementation for authentication and authorization, authorization schemes is weak or is not coded correctly, um, the attacker can easily gain access to the data or the functionality uh, that we have in our systems, or maybe can scale up uh, in the permissions tree. Um, this type of um, issue is, uh, is pretty common in legacy applications and reasonably common in ones written in from scratch. Um, the bright side to this is that most modern and future frameworks are usually secure, but the downside of this comes when we as developers try to extend or replace functionality that is given by the framework itself. And sometimes in the functionality isn't broken per se, but, uh, maybe with the changes that we have made, um, we, in, we expose us to some kind of brute force attack or uh, maybe can tamper the token rebook routine that uh, we have in our system when the user logs out of the application. So uh, in order to resolve um, these issues that may arise, um, we have to be mindful of some scenarios like, um, for example, if in the user tries to do a brute force attack, we can implement some type of uh, transaction rate limiter. So we dissuade the attacker to um, attack uh, our system this way. Um, we need to use a strong password hashing algorithm like the ones of Bcrypt or Argon D2, or maybe we can use some combination of salt and pepper to hash our passwords. Uh, also, we need to strengthen the password reset, reset process. For example, uh, we, we may uh, limit the times that the user um, can query us to reset the password or, and so on and so forth. And also we can enable uh, two-factor authentication uh, generally available in the app or uh, for some specific cases that the user needs, needs to access to some resource. And we need to consider this um, is it viable to introduce a denied and weak password list inside our system? Um, that is, and this is a polemic point um, of view because we cannot uh, possibly um, thought in uh, all the um, 
weak passwords that are out there and that may introduce some um, problems to our users. And also we need to consider an independent uh, code auditing service and penetration testing services. Uh, coming up in third place, we find uh, sensitive data exposure. Um, the prevalence and, and technical impact of in this um, uh, vulnerability is high. Um, because um, the data that lives inside our applications can be considered sensitive and it comes from uh, numerous forms like credit cards, uh, credentials, social security numbers, uh, browsing habits, and, and that is if we live in a country that this information is a valuable target, um, health information, financial information, etc. And this type of uh, vulnerability is often secondary to any type of uh, attack that we have seen today. It's not the primary goal of the attackers to reveal this type of information um, when they target our systems. Uh, it is common, uh, um, sorry, how common in, is, a, is this vulnerability a, amongst applications? Well, the evidence suggests that very few apps have a pessimistic approach on um, in, encryption policies. Uh, most common and most famous security breaches uh, that have occurred um, is because uh, the organization did, didn't encrypt the information uh, or didn't encrypt the sensitive information at all. So uh, in order to protect us from this type of threat, we need to analyze three scenarios and see how we can deal with them. Uh, the first one is when our data is at rest and we need to consider some form of full disencryption. Like for example, you are on a Windows-based environment, uh, you, should, you should use Windows BitLocker in your machine. Or for example, you are on a Mac OS environment, you, you should use Apple Fireball to encrypt all your data inside your, um, in your, inside your hard disk. And thus we can ensure that our data is protected against um, hardware theft. But this will not protect us from any form of uh, application vulnerability or in-browser vulnerability. For this, we need to take a look on the next scenario, and that is when our data is in transit. And to ensure that our communications are secure, we need to uh, enable HTTPS, and also we need to enable TLS or SSL to protect us from EVAS dropping or man-in-the-middle attacks. And thirdly, we need to analyze our key encryption rotation policies. And in this point, we need to ask ourselves, um, am I still using uh, the default encryption keys uh, in case we use some kind of hardware? Um, am I able to disable any key that has been compromised uh, quickly? Um, also, is it possible to encrypt uh, the data using new keys? And is it possible to change the faulty cryptography with new one? And also, uh, we need to learn about encryption and crypt uh, cryptography. That is a must. Uh, so we can become more proactive uh, on securing the data, um, we can develop a process so we can keep our encryption efforts consistent. Uh, next on this list is XML uh, external entities. And this type of, uh, this type of attack uh, may cause um, a denial of service or 
it may perform a file scan on our systems or do a remote code ex execution that can compromise the security of our systems. Uh, in order to prevent this, we need to understand the relationship between the XML, how it arrives to our application and how is it parsed and ultimately executed. So um, when an XML enters our application, it becomes parsed as a tree structure and it's ready to be used by other components. And this type of vulnerability um, relies on the use of XML in our application or even one of its uh, dependencies um, um, uses XML inside of our application. Um, this, um, this type of vulnerability often uh, allows the attacker to view um, system files or uh, um, application files in our server or uh, it allows to interact with any backend uh, or external systems that the application has access. And here we have an example of this type of attack. Uh, this XML script is called uh, Bill and Loves. And by declaring an entity type LOL here, um, the next entity type LOL1 then proceeds to instance 10 times the original entity LOL1. And next, the second entity LOL2 then proceeds to instance 10 times LOL1. And uh, LOL1 inside contains 10 times the original instance, LOL. So by now we have uh, 100 instances of LOL. And by the time it finishes parsing this entire XML, we have uh, 1 billion um, LOL entities that uh, approximately can take at least three gigs of uh, memory in our system and possibly it may cause uh, some DOS uh, attack. So in order to prevent this uh, type of attack, we can follow some guidelines in our systems. Uh, first, um, it's to remove the reliance of, on XML if possible. If not, we need to consider uh, upgrading our XML parsers in our systems. For example, uh, newer versions of .NET and, and .NET framework uh, parsers do not um, process uh, these type of entities at all. You need to explicitly configure the parser to do so. And if we cannot uh, upgrade, um, the XML parser, uh, we can disable the process of these uh, external entities. And, but we need to check if our uh, XMLs that are used, used in our applications rely on this feature. Uh, also, we can configure some timeouts and set a memory limit so in case of an attack, we can reboot our system or kill the parsing process. And as we saw on previous slides, we need to define an allow list um, so we can effective, effectively prevent in the, uh, this malformed XML uh, enters our system and we can ensure its security. In fifth place, uh, we find broken access control. And in terms of exploitability and detectability, uh, it's mild because um, the attacker needs to find a breach in our access control schemes. Uh, that will be via spoofing, via phishing, via brute force, or via URL, uh, et cetera. And when it gets uh, clearance, um, the attacker can create havoc inside our organization. And 
uh, it will have um, potentially expensive outcomes. And this type of security flaw comes um, from uh, different places. Um, when we as developers uh, miss or don't protect enough our data or a piece of functionality from unauthorized access. Or for example, when we imply that um, uh, if our resource uh, is hidden or a route is hidden or is not visible to the user, um, we assume that is some kind of, of permission. And also, uh, uh, when we have a single point of control to verify uh, the access and authorization for a resource, uh, when clearly what we need is uh, some uh, type of uh, multiple checks to verify that the user clearly has the correct permissions to access that resource. And to do this, we, we have something called the CIA triad that help us to develop a more robust and secure policies to access those resources. And the C in the CIA triad uh, stands for confidentiality. And uh, that will be as defining a set of rules and that limits the access to the information. And Protecting the, the information is dependent on being able to define uh, and enforce uh, some uh, sort of uh, access levels to the information. And uh, to achieve this, we, in, this involves uh, separating the information in various uh, collections uh, that are organized on uh, who needs access to that information and how sensitive that information is. The I in the CIA triad in, stands for integrity. And this is crucial for the CIA triad. And this was designed to protect the data from deletion or modification from any unauthorized parties. And this ensures that when an authorized party makes a change that they shouldn't have been made in the first place, that damage can be reversed. And the A stands for availability. And that information uh, needs to be available for access. And for that, we need that our authentication and access mechanisms and systems work properly for the information they need to protect. Also, um, it's a good thing to keep in mind that um, to have a checklist while we are developing and while doing a code review to check for these kind of flaws in, in our systems to mitigate them as early as possible. And also we need to keep a close look on our application logs so we can detect in this type of attack and we can learn from this type of attacks. Coming in number six, uh, in this top 10, we find uh, security misconfigurations. And these are holes or weaknesses within our applications that leave uh, our system vulnerable to attack. And these misconfigurations allow to, and to easy, easily exploit these uh, by trade agents from both inside our, inside our organization and outside of uh, our organization. The good news is that although it, these misconfigurations are common and they are also easily uh, detected and fixed, um, the downside um, they are they are uh, is that they aren't discovered um, as quickly as possible, uh, and this is done when the system has been compromised and the damage has been done. Uh, this type of vulnerability um, 
is quite common because it covers so many areas in, in our system. And for example, we could have an excellent code base, uh, but our deploy structure is not secure enough. And as an, as an outcome of this, this vulnerability could be exploited. So to overcome this type, uh, this scenario, we need to keep a consistent recipe uh, for our deployments. Um, in order to achieve this, we can leverage on automated tests and that, uh, that we develop uh, or tools or websites that target our website with a comprehensive suite of non-vulnerabilities that can be found, found out there. Um, some websites that search for this uh, type of misconfigurations or even lack of it uh, are ssllabs.com and securityheaders.com. Uh, but keep in mind that not all vulnerabilities, vulnerabilities sorry, are as serious as others. And for this, we can follow some guidelines offered by the OWAS Foundation that include um, keeping a consistent process on, on our app development lifecycle and server hardening. And, and for servers, we need to consider a minimal starting point uh, and go from there. Sometimes uh, less is better. Also, we need to keep, keep us informed on the latest vulnerabilities that are found out there. And we need to set up some automated checks and keep uh, a regular basis uh, on visiting these third party websites that I shared with you uh, to check if our, our application, our, our web app is um, secure enough uh, uh, from time to time. Um, also, we need to remove all privileges and, and user accounts that are, are unused or old. And also, we, we need to update um, individual software with the latest security patches. Uh, we need to update our legacy systems and we need to get rid of orphan custom code. Uh, coming up next uh, is cross-site scripting. And this occurs when an attacker injects uh, a malicious script uh, into our website. And when the user uh, inputs data uh, into the visited website, uh, this malicious code routes that input data to the attacker. Uh, some uh, XSS uh, vulnerability resides um, in any place uh, in any place that where the user can input uh, some data. For example, an URL, uh, a form, or even a social media post. And this type of uh, attacks can seriously damage our company because. Um, that attack code can be written in endless ways that uh, can cause more damage than reroute or stole data. And it can create um, internal and external end users uh, some issues that may cripple our site's availability and the ability to re generate revenue. So um, this type of uh, vulnerability is quite common uh, amongst applications. Uh, it, it says um, that for the 2017 survey, it affects two thirds of the applications that have been tested. But uh, some, some say that it reaches up to 90% of the applications out there. And uh, to make it worse, uh, it generally exists by default because uh, front-end frameworks and libraries do not enforce input validation or encoding by default. Uh, furthermore, um, 
whenever we are looking for some examples on how to implement a new feature or requirement in our application, the ones that we found do not include this type of checks or control for user inputs. So, um, in order to prevent this type of attacks, OWASP uh, got us covered with a great cheat sheet that we can find on their website. And we need to keep some, uh, some things in mind uh, while developing new, new components for our app. We need to have a consistent develop and review process to mitigate these type of attack vectors. Um, for example, uh, we can encode all non-static inputs, uh, sorry, all non-static outputs and use um, a content security policy header to restrict inline scripts and also scripts from other domains uh, as much as possible. The only downside to this is uh, the this CSP header um, is not supported by legacy browsers like IE11. Um, and for that, we need to enable other types of headers like X XSS protection. In number eight, uh, we find insecure desertization. And this is when user controllable data is deserialized by uh, our website. And this potentially enables an attacker to manipulate serialized objects in order to pass uh, into our application harmful data. Um, is it, uh, it's even possible to replace a serialized object with an object of an entire different class. And objects of any class that are available in our website will be deserialized and instantiated regardless of which class was, was expected. And for this reason, insecure deserialization uh, sometimes is known, is known as object injection. And an object um, that um, comes from an uh, unexpected class uh, may cause uh, an exception in our systems. However, by the time uh, and this is, uh, exception is raised and the damage may, may be already be done. And many deserialization based attacks are completed before the deserialization is finished. This means that the deserialization process itself can it and can initiate the attack. And even if the website's uh, own functionality does not interact with the malicious object at all. And for this reason, um, uh, websites whose logic is uh, based on strongly typed languages um, can also be vulnerable to this type of techniques. And, and this uh, usually arises because there is a general lack of understanding how dangerous uh, it is deserializing user controllable data. Ideally, user input should never be deserialized at all. And these type of attacks are also made possible uh, because of the number of dependencies that exist uh, in modern uh, websites. A uh, typical website may, uh, might implement uh, different libraries and each one of, uh, of these uh, will have its own dependencies as well. And this creates a massive pool of classes and methods that are, are difficult to manage securely and then an attacker um, may create an instance, instance of any of these classes. And it is pretty hard to predict which methods can be invoked uh, on the malicious data. Uh, also, um, if you do need to deserialize uh, data from 
untrusted sources, you need to incorporate some robust measures to make sure that the data that the user uh, or the untrust sources uh, sent to you has not been tampered with. Uh, for this, for example, you can implement some digital signature to check the integrity of the data. However, you must remember to check in that digital signature before even beginning the deserialization process. If you do it the other way around, well, it's pretty, pretty much useless. And coming in number nine, um, we have components with known vulnerabilities. And components and components with known security vulnerabilities are gaps uh, in the secure in the security that have been found either by the developer or the vendor of the products that we use or by the user or by the developer or sometimes by the hacker or attacker itself um, to exploit a uh, known vulnerabilities, uh, hackers need to identify some weak components um, inside our system by uh, scanning it with a set of automated tools. This is more common because uh, hacking tools are available online or by annual analyzing components manually. This is much less common because it in, it takes more advanced skills. And almost all applications have at least some type of vulnerabilities due to weaknesses in the components or libraries in the application depends on. Uh, sometimes uh, these vulnerabilities are deliberated because uh, vendors um, are tend to known to leave backdoors so they can access the system remotely once it's deployed. But most, most of the times, uh, most vulnerabilities are unintentional and that security gaps uh, are inherent uh, in the design of the product. So uh, in order to assess um, and the vulnerabilities that we have in our systems, and you need to search uh, all of the various databases that are related to your components and try to stay on top of the project mailing list or announcements that are made by the company that developed that product or, the, or in community forums that issues in this type of uh, vulnerabilities regularly. And when you identify a known vulnerability in one of your components, uh, you need to check if your code actually uses that part of that component. Uh, and also you need to determine if that flaw actually impacts your application. Uh, another way to uh, protect you uh, your applications against using components with known vulnerabilities is not to use any components except and that and you have written yourself. But uh, let's be honest, uh, this is not an option in most uh, development life cycles because there is just not enough time and money to develop new components from scratch uh, for each new application that uh, you develop. Um, usually, uh, that and those components um, can be corrected via an upgrade to a new version, or sometimes just ditching it out and moving to a new type of component that is out there. So the the best approach is to quickly um, um, stay on the on the lookout for this type of vulnerabilities and upgrade as, as quick as possible. And lastly, we have um, insufficient logging and monitoring. And according to OWASP, the exploitation of insufficient logging and monitoring is the bedrock for nearly every major incident. And attackers rely on 
the lack of monitoring and timely response to achieve their goals without being detected. Um, with the creative and aggressive and talented attackers that are, and that are, out, are out there, uh, the threat landscape uh, evolves constantly with more inno innovative methods and attacks. And hence, we can simply pretend that, uh, to be capable to forecast anymore where the security issues or the cybersecurity attacks will emerge from. Um, the occurrence of numerous attacks uh, has shown us that defending from cybersecurity today is something more than knowing the weakness. Uh, it's all about revealing the blind spots. So uh, a typical log architecture generates both security and operational logs. Uh, it analyzes, store, and monitor those logs. And this is not only important on, on dealing with those threats um, that result from insufficient logging and monitoring, but, but also from regul uh, regulatory compliance as well. And security logs differ from operational logs. Um, uh, for instance, uh, the operational logs are also known as operating system logs, and these will include uh, routine system events like uh, uh, logging and logouts and shutdowns on workstations and servers and networks. And they will also uh, derive uh, logs from uh, associated uh, security software. And security logs uh, from security software uh, also include logs from uh, firewalls, uh, connections, um, um, revoke uh, some connection to some site or some um, resource, uh, routers, uh, host or network security devices and services. Uh, however, Sometimes those security logs are deemed supplementary depending on what a company requires for an investigation into a vulnerability or a threat. Uh, either way, both logs are invaluable uh, for identifying and resolving insufficient logging and monitoring vulnerabilities. And in order to prevent uh, in our systems insufficient logging and monitoring, we can follow these guidelines. Uh, we need to ensure that all logging, access control failures, and server-side input validation failures can be logged uh, with enough user context to identify these suspicious or malicious accounts uh, and those logs need to be held for sufficient time to allow delayed forensic analysis. Uh, also, we need to ensure that uh, logs are generated in a format that can be easily consumed by a centralized log management solution. Also, uh, we need to ensure uh, a high value, that high value transactions have an audit trail uh, with uh, some kind of integrity controls to prevent tampering or deletion. And we need to establish effective monitoring and alerting such that suspicious activities are detected and, and, respond, and responded as soon as possible. And also we need to establish and adapt uh, an incident response and recovery plan. Well, and that will be all uh, that will be covered today. Uh, thank you so much for your time and for your presence here. And if you have any questions, um, we can answer them in the Q&A section. Uh, feel free to drop them by. Thank you so much. If, if you have any questions or feedback, uh, you have um, uh, mail uh, down in the Q&A section. Thank you so much for your time and take care.